you're here. Um, so my name is Chris Karnowskis, and I'm an associate professor of atmospheric and oceanic sciences uh, here at the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, I'm also a fellow of the Cooperative Institute for Research and Environmental Sciences, which is a partnership between the University of Colorado and the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, also known as NOAA. So my background is in climate science and physical oceanography. Um, I assume if you're on this webinar, you probably know what physical oceanography means, but um, it's one of the major branches of oceanography, of course, um, the one that deals with the physics and dynamics of the ocean circulation, temperatures, and so on. Um, it's really key, a key part of the climate system on planet Earth. And um, it's also closely related with other branches of oceanography, such as marine biology, uh, chemical oceanography, marine geology, the study of the seafloor, and so on. Um, but my passion really lies in the intersection of physical oceanography and climate, hence the title of the book. Um, so how does the ocean interact with the atmosphere, both responding to phenomena in the atmosphere and driving processes in the atmosphere uh, in order to create what we measure and think about as climate variability and change? So um, I didn't always know that I wanted to be an oceanographer. Uh, or a climate scientist for that matter. My gateway uh, into this was really an interest in meteorology, like uh, many of my colleagues actually. Um, I knew I loved it as early as middle school, and by high school I was pretty certain that I wanted to go to college and get a degree in meteorology. Um, the atmosphere seemed to be it for me, and uh, growing up in a landlocked state in the U.S., of course I, I uh, didn't see far beyond that yet. Um, but some courses in college, and for me, that was the University of Wisconsin in Madison, uh, really opened my eyes to climate. I, I realized that as a discipline, um, you know, it was far more than just the, the statistics of weather and the, the research problems that were there seemed fascinating to me. So, um, you know, just some of the ways that we were and, and are able to observe the global atmosphere, like satellites, for example, you know, were, were sort of mesmerizing to me as a student. And I, I learned that um, we had been doing that for, for long enough to see beyond the weather and actually look at this beautiful continuum of uh, climate variability. So some research that I got involved with along those lines sort of sold me immediately on the idea of going for a PhD. Um, but I wasn't really sold on the ocean until my first year in graduate school, which um, I attended at uh, the University of Maryland and studied under Dr. Tony Busalaki. Um, and that's when I really started doing some analysis of observations and modeling of both the o ocean and the atmosphere in the tropics and realized that, you know, they were really one and the same, kind of like yin and yang, sometimes pulling in different uh, directions. But in the end, they, they produce rhythms together in the climate system that are um, what they are because of the close coupling between the two fluids, the ocean and the atmosphere. So beyond there, um, my career took me to posts at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, uh, part of Columbia University in New York, and the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution in Massachusetts. Um, but what I think is sort of striking looking back at my career and the evolution of my interests is actually how long it took me to appreciate what a crucial role the ocean plays in everything around us, including climate. Um, you know, both why the, the average climate is what it is and, and why it changes from year to year, from decade to decade, and on, you know, longer time scales like climate change. Um, and part of it may be a product of, of the way that departments and um, programs are set up. You know, you have a lot of atmospheric science and meteorology programs out there. And then you have some that are blended into a department of atmospheric and oceanic sciences, like the one that I work in right now. Um, but those are typically uh, heavily biased on the atmospheric side, historically, uh, in terms of faculty and course offerings. So it's not until you look at the serious oceanography programs, you know, where you're going to get hit, hit in the face with physical oceanography. And then the problem, I think, becomes that you can get so bogged down in the, the heavy-duty GFD uh, perspective on physical oceanography that you might lose sight of its importance um, and its its partnership with the atmosphere in climate. So I'm a, I'm a product of those types of programs, those blended atmospheric and oceanic science programs, but um, I know how easy it is to get through it all while saying, you know, nah, I like the weather or maybe even worse, I like climate, but I'm not that interested in oceanography. So this book, um, 
tries to accelerate students in a sense who are interested in climate science, uh, whether or not they know it yet, uh, they need a good course on how the ocean works. Um, so they aren't missing half or at least half of the, the climate puzzle that they're, they're trying to understand. So um, this isn't an in-your-face GFD book uh, per se with, with pages after pages of derivations on one thing. Those, book exi those books exist um, and there, there are some great ones and you need that eventually if you're going to go into a research career focused, you know, uh, beginning with graduate school onward, focused on physical oceanography. Um, and this book can be an effective gateway uh, to that since you'll know why you're subjecting yourself to that uh, pain or pleasure depending on your taste. But um, I think where this book shines, based on my experience teaching this course at CU Boulder and similar ones elsewhere, um, is for students with some background in atmospheric science or climate or other fields entirely, but they have a suspicion that they're going to need a working knowledge of how the of the ocean. Um, so it's a it's a gentle entry, uh, I would say, into what's sometimes an opaque field to others. Um, yet before you know it, you're sort of picking apart. Uh, partial differential equations uh, that describe the time evolution of some key ocean variables like temperature and salinity and currents. So a large, a large focus of the book is on the upper ocean. And the reason for that, you know, is that that's really where the rubber meets the road in terms of the interaction between the ocean and atmosphere. Um, we look at the physical processes that determine things like temperature and salinity um, and velocity, you know, currents and so forth. Um, but I go out of my way to po point out every time there's there's some inroad for the atmosphere to uh, have an impact on the ocean. You know, whether it's through the the heat budget or uh, the momentum budget and the the wind driven ocean circulation. You know, this really makes that connection between the ocean and atmosphere uh, hopefully clear. Um, and then how how those interactions actually give rise to coupled climate variability on a variety of timescales. Um, Towards the end of the book, I give a sort of a, a broader view of anthropogenic climate change, including radiative forcing, um, but also, you know, how do climate models work and what are the, how do the ocean parts of climate models work in there? And essentially, um, you realize that they're, they're just coded up versions of all of the physics and dynamics you just spent a whole semester learning about. So, um, in terms of the audience, I, I think it's 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 ideal for a one semester um, upper level, upper division undergraduate course in any kind of a department like atmospheric science or oceanography or you know a mix of the two it can also serve as a an elective for graduate students um, in virtually any department within the earth sciences, really, if they have an interest in the ocean. Um, here at the University of Colorado Boulder, I actually offer it as both at once. It's a mixed um, upper division undergrad and graduate course, and that, that works pretty well. Um, so there's a number of ways to divide it up in a semester, and I'm happy to share my thoughts on that if anybody uh, wants. Um, I was asked to touch a little bit on ways in which the various features of this book um, sort of lend themselves to remote teaching or hybrid models of instruction. And so I can comment on a few of those things before um, opening it up here for questions. Um, you know, one, one, unique of the, one unique feature of the book that I think um, or hope instruct, instructors and students will appreciate, especially during these times where we have to be ready with a variety of modes of teaching, is a feature that we've called Dive Into the Data. Um, this is a set of uh, essentially insets or boxes in the embedded into each chapter of, of the book. And what they're intending to do is to provide a, a direct, easy gateway into popular data sets um, that are actually used in ocean and climate research. You know, not just hypothetical made up data to practice analyzing, but actual research grade data that um, that we use in our in our you know papers that we publish on oceanography so um this includes observations as well as model output including the latest uh generation of global climate models um at least a subset of them um so in total there's uh 27 individual data sets that are included uh, via these dive into the data boxes and what you'll find in each of the um the boxes in the pages of the book is sort of a description a synopsis of like, how did this data set, um, how, how was it produced? What is it, you know, typically used for within the scientific community? 
Um, and then in the end of the chapter problems, many of the questions actually refer to those data sets. So you could, as an instructor, require a certain number of analysis questions on a homework assignment or just use them for a sort of a group project or, or something like that. Um, you know, why did I go to the trouble of rounding up? You know, I'm not just providing links to 27 data sets. I went to the trouble of, you know, rounding up the data sets and putting them all into a very, you know, narrowly focused um, format uh, so that, you know, once you know how to open any data, any one of them, you're good to go with all of them. And that's because uh, if anybody on this call is a, you know, practicing researcher, you know, um, pretty much every every data set we work with that comes from a different institution or government agency, you know, has a different portal, like a web portal or FTP site, or things are constantly moving around different data formats, different quality control uh, standards and flags. And then the metadata can be uh, good or they can be, you know, inadequate or even missing. So, um, you know, I, in my career, I need to use a lot of different data sets. And so, you know, it was uh, kind of a no brainer to round them up and put them all in one warehouse, which you can get on the, the book's resources page. Um, so uh, you'll find them all in a, a single format, even some bare bones scripts to open each one of them. So each data set comes with a data file and a script to go ahead and open it and start um, getting you started with making some plots with the data sets. That way you don't have to go hunting for all of these and navigating all the dead links. Um, okay, so related to that, I would also say that, you know, I um, being sort of a, a combination of, um, you know, interested in the mathematics of everything, but also a very much a visual learner. And I find that I um, get a lot of mileage out of um, good diagrams in the classroom. I sort of poured my heart into the illustrations of each chapter. Um, there's a total of, I counted, had to count again today, 83 figures in the book. And a few of them are photos or reproductions from the, you know, primary sources, other journal articles. Um, but the vast majority of them are, are visualizations of real data. And that sort of links with the dive into the data um, feature. You can see a figure in the book and say, oh, that's interesting, but I'd prefer to make it a different way. You can just get the data set that I use to make that figure and put it in the book and then remake it yourself in a different way or um, analyze the data behind it in, in whatever way you like. Um, you know, so uh, this is this is part of an effort to sort of meld the underlying mathematics with a lasting conceptual impression, um, which, you know, different students will work, uh, will jive with that different ways. And so I think kind of um, presenting things both mathematically as well as conceptually at the same time is, uh, I found um, good luck with that in my own teaching. So um, I think a lot of the figures in the book can be used as sort of a basis for a discussion among students to really make sure that they can walk themselves through it. Um, you know, like if you can take the, take a diagram that seems kind of crazy to someone who's not in the class and actually explain it to them so that they understand it, then you really understand that concept. Um, okay, so if you uh, have students that aren't in the classroom or miss a lecture for some reason, you know, you have it right there. Uh, the diagrams are sort of presented in, in a way that you would present them if you were standing at a whiteboard. Oftentimes, the diagrams are sort of step by step. Here's this concept beginning from very simple first principles and then building it up to its full complexity uh, so that you don't just, you know, overwhelm students visually with everything all at one time. Um, you know, I, I can't really bring myself to write in a super formal or intimidating way. <laughs> um, the tone of the book, I would say, and, and I guess others have said, is sort of conversational. And I think that goes a long ways for the students, because if they're if a student's trying to digest some material for the class using the book, um, this way it enters their head in, a, in, in much the same way that you or I, the instructor, might have said it verbally in a medium, you know, a, a medium sized classroom full of students that you've gotten to know. So I try to write it in that way so that if you, you know, before COVID-19, my the reason would be, well, if you missed a lecture because you slept in or something, uh, I can tell you exactly what section we covered. And it's going to it's going to sound much the same way it would have been taught in the classroom, not to encourage uh, skipping class. But, you know, now this means even more because of um, COVID-19. And then finally, um, I guess I just wanted to mention that I, I did make a deliberate attempt 
uh, in each chapter to highlight the diversity of climate scientists making exciting pro progress and discoveries in the field. Um, you know, it gets sort of painful writing this the narrative of developments and say, um, you know, like wind driven ocean circulation from the middle of uh, the last century with the legendary guys like, you know, Ekman, Stommel, Sverdrup, Monk, so on, um, all, all men, and it becomes kind of nauseating. So I, I did make it a priority from the very beginning of writing this book to especially highlight the gender diversity um, of the field, including, you know, pointing out many of uh, the important advances in the field owing to many of my field, female colleagues around the world. Um, I have a five-year-old daughter uh, who may be watching right now, which is sort of embarrassing, but, um, you know, she actually helped me pick out the cover of the book. And when, when she can read words that are longer than three or four letters, I want her to see that women are leading this field and she can jump in if she wants. Um, hi, CJ. Happy birthday, Dean. <laughs> okay, so anyway, I think that's enough from me. And um, let's see, with the help of the Cambridge staff, I think I'd like to open it up for, for questions and discussion now. And I did see something come across the screen here. Okay, so I could not see exactly what data set used in the book from access accessing the contents. Could you write? Okay, so um, each of the dive into the data boxes in the book refers to a file. It actually says the file name right there in the box. So it might be like, they're very simple file names. So it might be like um, SST or OLR, you know, sort of, uh, I'm providing you a data set that is outgoing long wave radiation measured by satellites, you know, and um, it'll be called OLR.m and OLR.mat. So you've got a script and a, and a file at the same time. And I noticed you asked about, um, you know, the format, and that's a good question. I, I went, um, I did think about this a lot. Um, you know, for example, why, why, why MATLAB rather than something totally open source like Python? Um, you know, many of the graduate students are moving towards Python very rapidly, um, but not all of them are there yet. And especially with undergraduates, um, that was a concern. And I think most academic institutions do have a MATLAB site license for now. And so I saw this as the easiest way for instructor, instructors to integrate the data into the course um, with minimal headache and not, you know, spending the whole time walking around the room troubleshooting a classroom full of students if they don't have the right libraries. Um, but that said, you know, students who wish to use Python, there are libraries such as SciPy, right, that um, can read in MATLAB formatted data files, .mat files, uh, with about two lines of code. So I, I saw that as the most accessible route that didn't exclude options for using Python. Yeah, so just to be clear, um, that's out of convenience. And for most people at this point, you don't need to be an expert or even a user at all of MATLAB if you don't want to, to, to still get the most out of the dive into the data boxes. I hope that answers the question. Um, thanks for the question, Cindy. Uh, no, I mean, actually, I this was really developed with undergraduates in mind. Um, it was developed with with sort of if you have a if you're in a department with a major uh, that offers a, a major or a specialization in atmospheric and oceanic sciences, I think that's really the sweet spot. Um, but it's got enough sort of advanced material to um, and especially opportunities for students to make what they want out of it. Um, that sort of um, it could be an inter introductory graduate course, but I often get a lot of students from graduate students from other departments like geology, like say you've got a um, paleoclimate graduate student. I, I frequently get paleoclimate graduate students from the Department of Geology um, joining. And um, this is sort of a, 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 a brand of physical oceanography that's relevant and um, you know, useful for, for, for a research career if it interfaces with oceanography. But no, I think, um, the answer is really no. It would. It, this is um, was sort of built with those undergraduates in mind, and uh, they don't need they don't need um, years and years of of uh, calculus and diffie cues to to do it. You know, the first chapter does sort of give you a rundown on the basic math that you're going. You know, the the essential math constructs that you're going to need. Um, we don't go um, necessarily. Um, 
solving differential equations, but we, we want to look at them in order to understand um, how the system works. So if this term over here changes, how does temperature change? You know, we're, we're, you're using them as a tool, but um, it's pretty accessible for a good range of undergrads. Thanks for the question, Cindy. Thank you. So, uh, Brian, I, I believe that's a comment. Correct me if I'm wrong, but um, you said there's a good mix of, of instructor resources available on the website. And that's, uh, thank you. I, I'm hoping that's the case because I put a lot of effort into those resources, but thanks. Okay, so how did I select the data sets um, when curating the dive into the data collection? Um, well, that was kind of fun because really uh, we, my, my field, this field of climate science and oceanography is just extremely data intensive these days. We have more data streaming in from satellites and models and um, in situ, you know, observing systems out, that are literally out in the ocean, then we have, you know, we don't have enough people to analyze it all. So, um, you know, I think, uh, I, I tried to think about, um, you know, well, first of all, if they were used in the production of, of one of the illustrations that I made for the book, that was kind of a, an indication that that'd be a good one. Because if I'm showing a, a figure to explain a concept using real data, that's uh, that's a data set I think the students should be able to get their hands on if they want to um, and and manipulate the data set. Don't just make graphs, but like actually analyze it, do, do something creative with it. Um, I think that those data sets were included because um, they could make engaging small group projects, you know, in, in the classroom, they can work together as, as a as a small team, like two or three students, or of course in um, COVID-19 land, you can send them to breakout rooms if you're using Zoom and have them work on something together and collaborate. collaborate. Um, they also, you know, if I was writing a homework assignment or a homework, uh, an end of the chapter problem that I would anticipate being used as a homework question, um, you know, I was thinking about, you know, what would be, what would be insightful data sets to analyze in order to really solidify the concepts that are in the book. Um, so they're, you know, they're not just trivial data sets. Like here's an example, a um, bunch of numbers and practice analyzing it. You're, you're going to be analyzing real data, um, pretty, pretty up to date, you know, uh, up to the time when sort of capped this off. Um, who knows, your students might even find themselves doing something really novel with it, which could um, and I've seen this happen in my classroom. Um, it can serve as a jumping off point for an independent study project or a senior thesis project. Basically, any one of those data sets, uh, especially if you start combining a couple of them, you can start there and just dream and think, okay, what sorts of, you know, mysteries in the climate system and in the ocean could I sort of try to solve with this? What, what would be interesting to analyze against each other? So... Those are those are some of the things going through my head when I was selecting them. Okay, this is coming from someone who sent it to Cambridge. Saw your blog post and tweet that highlighted a conceptual diagram from chapter six, tying the atmospheric general circulation to why the big ocean gyrus flow the direction that they do. Um, can you give an example or two of your favorite illustrations portraying real observational data and how it ties together those mathematical, conceptual, and real world perspectives? Good question. Um, okay, so I, I will. Um, I was told to an, announce to the Cambridge staff that I'm going to share my screen. So I'm going to share my screen, and then I'm going to find a picture. Let me get the picture first before I share it. Okay, so um, if the Cambridge staff wouldn't mind giving me a, a note in the chat that you can see. A figure. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, okay, so this is a this is figure six point three in the book. So it's the third you know figure in chapter six, um, which is about wind forcing the ocean circulation. And um, this is all real data. You know, it it it's uh, it's meant to illustrate sort of a, a an effect of the atmosphere on the ocean in this case. Um, and, you know, what you're seeing on the left-hand side is, is kind of a, without going into the gory details, it's, it's something about the wind. It's the way that the wind um, field is uh, blowing along the coast of California. So just to orient you, 
this coastline that you see running kind of down the middle of the, the graphic, that is the coast of um, the west coast of North America from um, just the where it meets Canada down to the US and um, Southern California at the bottom. And over the ocean on the left or west side of the, the figure, you know, you're seeing this blob of red. And again, without getting into the details, um, it, it describes how much the wind is rotating in a sense. It's called the wind stress curl. And it's plotted with winds that are um, from that are measured by satellite. And that data set is actually is one of the data sets that's provided in the dive, dive into data. And then in the middle, what you see is um, at the same time, you see the ocean temperature, the sea surface temperature. So it's the, it's the temperature of the water exactly at the surface um, of the ocean. And if, that's why you see no colors over land because this is ocean temperature. But you see this strip of, um, you know, no pronounced uh, cold water that's sort of hugging the coast of, um, you know, from Washington and Oregon down through California. And uh, this is solidifying a concept that the wind stress curl creates conditions that are that are driving water to to um, flow upwards called upwelling um, and reach the surface, which cools the surface because water that comes up from below is cold. And then on the right hand side, um, what you're looking at is satellite measured. All of this is from satellite, by the way. Um, <clears throat> satellite measured concentrations of chlorophyll in the ocean. And this is a, an indicator of the amount of productivity in the water. So high concentrations of chlorophyll, uh, which is just a green pigment, it tells you how much um, photosynthesis is taking place in the water. So the, the more concentration of chlorophyll you see there, it's an indication of very productive, uh, rich ecosystem, which is why this is a famous region for fisheries, because uh, fish need something to eat. And this comes all the way down to the base of the marine food web here. But all three of these data sets are actually included in the, the dive into the data. Um, and they would all be sort of a data wrangling exercise, not impossible, but um, to send a bunch of students off to find these data sets and you know, download the right version of them and so on. This way, everybody's on the same page. And it um, sort of serves to solidify a point that the, how, the wind, um, how the wind is blowing over the ocean is able to drive circulation in the ocean and ultimately determine the temperature and how much life is in the ocean at that, at that spot. So that's, that's one. How do you typically divide up chapters into discrete units over the semester and how would you anticipate changing that in a remote teaching situation? Um, okay, well, I think normally um, I've, I've tried two different ways. It doesn't really make a huge difference. I think if I'm gonna be able to share this again, I'm gonna share the table of contents this time. Okay, I'm gonna assume that that is visible to everybody. So um, of course the table of contents has a a short version, and then there's a long version, but let's just look at the short version for a second. So under normal circumstances in, the, in a you know, class with 30 or 40 students, um, maybe 10 of which are grad students, you know, um, what I would do is um, one of two things. One, I would divide it up into three units. And I think I like that, I've liked that better. Um, it's just a little bit less to hold in um, short-term memory at a time, but the three units are, sort of these, uh, the first three chapters, one, two, and three, where um, you get through, you know, this introduction, but then the heat and salt budgets are very similar. Um, you know, as a, as a mathematical construct, it's very similar. Um, and so it's, it goes well together and it, it ultimately sort of ties together the thermodynamics of the upper ocean. And of course, if you're an oceanographer on this call, you know that um, density, which is a really important variable in ocean, circulation is determined by two things, temperature and salinity. So you can sort of look at it like these first three chapters, you know, set the stage and then help you understand what sets the density of the ocean, which says a lot about stratification and all sorts of stuff. Um, the second unit that I could, that I would put together um, is the next three chapters, which covers, you start, it, you start to transition from thermodynamics into dynamics here. So the momentum budget, you know, these are the Navier-Stokes equations, um, uh, presented in a fairly accessible way where, you know, you don't have to be um, a total math whiz to get it. We're going to, we build up the, the parts of the momentum budget piece by piece. What are the various forces acting on a parcel of seawater that can make it accelerate um, and so on. 
So this is sort of like the momentum bud budget in general, but then we bring in the atmosphere um, because, and, and I wait until then to bring in the atmosphere. I know a lot of books on the oceanographer, oceanography, chapter one is the atmosphere. <laughs> I didn't really want to do that. I wanted to, um, you know, have this, have this set up a framework to understand how the ocean works and then bring in the atmosphere at the right time. We're going to bring it in here because it has a big impact on the, you know, through the wind, it has a big impact on the momentum budget. Once you've got those two constructs down, you've got, you've got all the tools you need to understand the wind-driven ocean circulation or the, want, the response of the ocean to wind forcing. So unit two would be uh, chapters four, five, and six. Okay, and then seven, eight, and nine make up the third unit where um, you know, it's really about bringing all of these things together to um, understand the coupling between the ocean and atmosphere. There's a whole chapter just on coupled climate variability, including mechanisms that you wouldn't have heard about before this chapter, but you know the sort of underlying physical principles to get into those mechanisms of coupled ocean atmosphere variability. This is where ENSO comes in, other modes of climate variability all around the world from the you know, equator to the poles. And then response to buoyancy forcing um, brings in the thermo, the thermohaline circulation, of course, but also we're still in this mode of thinking about climate variability because here's a great time to bring in paleoclimate. You know, so many of so many paleoclimate records, uh, all the fa you know the famous ones, um, they have taught us that that's where we've learned you know a huge amount of what we know about the thermohaline circulation is about its slowly varying component over very long time scales. So I, I spend a, a, a decent amount of time in this chapter, response to buoyancy forcing, talking about what we know about the thermohaline circulation from proxies, how those proxies work, you know, for in sort of a primer sense. And then climate change in the ocean, where the focus is on anthropogenic climate change. Um, so I, I could see that as three units. If you are um, really wanting to do two units, it would make sense to me to um, do one through um, six as one, where you really um, sort of hammer all of the dynamics and the all the nuts and bolts, and then really, and then, you know, flesh out seven, eight, and nine with more projects uh, that draw from the data to see how the ocean and atmosphere interact. That might be a pretty heavy burden with all those chapters, but I like, I like the three unit approach. I think under COVID-19 circumstances, um, depending on what happens this fall at CU Boulder, um, I would, I could see really shortening uh, the sort of amount of stuff that students have to hold in memory before being, um, before being evaluated. I think that I would, I would even go as far as one chapter and then have a, have this sort of online quiz, um, but then have it a little, shift a little bit more to project-based learning, you know, short projects that sort of tie together two chapters at once that draw from the dive into the data boxes. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't, I don't think I would want, you know, students to have to remember more than a chapter or two uh, in a remote learning modality um, before doing a, a nice, um, concise evaluation, which could be done online. And then um, you don't have to worry about issues with taking, you know, midterms um, remotely. I think it probably lends itself well to that. So that that that's my take on on how to break it up, um, you know, based on experience here at CU Boulder, but sort of um, guessing what would probably work well in terms of COVID nineteen under a remote situation. Yeah, um, that's a good question. So I think. Um, you know, I sort of go back to the, the question is what's unique? What, what, um, what's something that was lacking in, in competitive books on the market? So I think what, what this one does is it, is it really focuses on what's important for the upper ocean for somebody who is, you know, fundamentally interested in climate. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that, you know, I could actually turn this question around and, and say what this book doesn't cover. We don't cover a lot of the um, things that you'll see in a lot of textbooks, if it, if it doesn't have a direct connection to climate or like a really obvious direct connection to climate, um, everything does. But, you know, tides, for example, uh, this book does not cover tides. Um, it's, it's, it's probably hard for students to see a, a concrete connection between um, 
you know, tides and uh, waves breaking on a beach and climate. So we're really focused on the larger scale climate. This sets you up well to be a better atmospheric scientist because, uh, you know, 70 whatever percent of the surface boundary condition of the atmosphere is the ocean. And if you understand how ocean temperature anomalies, um, you know, warmer than normal, colder than normal actually influences the wind and other things going on in the planetary boundary layer of the atmosphere, um, I'd say, you know, that's that's pretty novel. This whole, um, you know, chunk of a chapter is actually devoted to looking at how um, how the atmosphere responds to ocean temperature anomalies. And that's something that I think is lacking on the market. I drew all of it from, you know, primary sources, lots going back and reading lots of papers that I probably started reading as a graduate student um, on, you know, what, what do we know about different theories. Um, there are actually several different competing theories um, that we're still trying to work out um, about how, you know, warm and cold anomalies at the ocean surface influence the circulation in the atmosphere. And um, I think that's a pretty big deal for people who are interested in studying coupled climate variability. Okay, so I'm getting, uh, an, I didn't, sorry, I didn't see that. I'm getting a note in the private chat from Cambridge that um, I can start wrapping up um, as we're already past a half hour. Uh, thank you for everybody for joining me. Um, I hope you found this worthwhile for um, thinking about, you know, books and feel free to email me if you ever have any questions or comments or suggestions. Um, I'm here and uh, hope to uh, meet you one day.